Okay, as the final part of Module 3, dealing with probability, we're going to take a look at what's called the Central Limit Theorem, which is a vitally important and uh, surprising and wonderful uh, theorem about how samples uh, converge in distribution to the normal distribution. We first want to be clear about what the difference is between a sample statistic versus a population parameter, and then investigate the central limit theorem and how to apply the central limit theorem. So a parameter is a numerical descriptive measure of an entire population. And common parameters that we might use in a description of a, a statistical distribution would be mu for the mean of that distribution and sigma for the standard deviation of that distribution. Now the thing about a population is we're able to observe uh, every item, every member uh, every possible event in the population uh, to get an exact measurement of the true population mean and the true population uh, standard deviation. And there is only one true mean, and there is only one true standard deviation. Now the problem is that we almost never have access to all of the data about every single event in the entire population. So, in, in fact, in statistics, we're almost always trying to estimate what the mean of a population is and what the standard deviation is for the population and what various other uh, statistics about the population is. A sample statistic is a numerical descriptive measure of one sample from a population. And for the mean, it's common to use the notation x bar, where we think of x as being the value of each observation, and x bar is simply the sum of the values of those observations divided by the number of ob observations that we make. And then s is the standard deviation of that a particular collection of observations. Okay, so we take a sample of some number n uh, of the items in the population and we then are able to calculate based on that number of uh, items that we've sampled a sampling x bar and a sampling standard deviation. These are estimates of the true population parameter. Now the thing is that although the true population parameters are fixed, the true mean of the population is fixed and the true standard deviation of the population is fixed. Each time we take a sample of n observations from that population, we're going to get very likely a different estimate of the mean and a different estimate uh, of the standard deviation. All right, so this sampling, sti this sample statistic uh, of a distribution is itself a random variable and therefore the collection of all possible samples uh, of n observations from some underlying distribution create a distribution of uh, statistical results for the random samples. That is, we have a distribution of the sample means, we have a distribution of the sample standard deviations, etc. Uh, let's consider as an example, um, we might want to know the average income of all of the households in India. If we knew the income of every single individual household in India, we could just add them up and divide by the number of households and we would get the true 
population parameter mu uh, for the average income of all Indian households. But we don't have uh, easy access to the uh, income of each household in India. So we have to estimate this from a sample. Let's suppose that we select a thousand households at random. Then we can compute x bar for that particular sample of a thousand. Uh, we could call it x bar sub i, let's say, for for the ith sample of a thousand households. That is an estimate of the true population mean average income. Unfortunately, occasionally, we're going to have a sample that accidentally includes uh, a whole lot of low-income households, and so the x bar that we get from that particular sample is going to be perhaps quite a lot lower than the true population mean. And on the other hand, accidentally we might get a sample where uh, we have a lot of people with high or a lot of households with high incomes. And so in that case, the, the sample mean is going to be quite a bit higher than the true population mean. Okay, so over all the possible samples of 1,000 households that we might select, we would assume that the majority of those samples are going to give us means that are fairly close, reasonably close to the population mean. But we know that some of them, just purely by good luck or bad luck, uh, are going to be well below the true population mean and well above the true population mean. Therefore, the, the samples themselves are random variables and the samples have a probability distribution. This population distribution here, for example, uh, might represent the number of years of education uh, of people in a given population. Uh, perhaps we have a peak around high school graduation, another peak, a lower peak around college graduation. Uh, we have you know, people with different numbers of uh, years of education in here. And if we grab a popula uh, if we grab, pardon me, a sample of a hundred of these people at random and compute their average years of, pop of uh, education, we will get a value for X bar for that sample. So X bar sub one, X bar sub two, X bar sub three, for all the various possible samples of a hundred people that we might draw from this distribution. The x bar sub i's from all of those samples are themselves going to have a distribution. And we could, for example, uh, uh, create a plot of that distribution uh, based on a simulation te technique, let's say. All right, so this distribution of the sample means is called the sampling distribution of the sample means for that given population. Uh, and in fact, any statistics that you can calculate from a sample will have its own sampling distribution. So if we, uh, if we calculated the standard deviation for each sample, there would be a sampling distribution of all of the possible sample standard deviations. Or if we calculated the range uh, between the minimum and the maximum for each sample. Then we would have a sampling distribution of the sizes of the ranges for all possible samples, etc., etc. Okay? Now, in each case, the sampling distribution assumes that each of the samples has some fixed size uh, n. So we can create a sampling distribution for sample means where we've selected 100 people at random, we'd have a different sampling distribution for uh, the sample means where we picked uh, a thousand households uh, in India, for example. Um, okay, so we get a sampling distribution for, uh, in this example, the sample means uh, over all the possible sam uh, samples of a given size. 
All right, so in other words, or to summarize, or here we're going to actually describe the central limit theorem. Suppose that we take a random sample of some n number of observations from a population where the true mean is mu and the true standard deviation is, is sigma. Okay. Now, regardless of the distribution, the shape of the distribution of the underlying uh, observations that we're making, as the number of items in our sample gets larger, the sampling distribution of the x bars, the sampling distribution of the means of the samples, I don't seem to be able to highlight that, there we go, approaches a normal distribution. And furthermore, the mean of the sampling distribution is going to be or is going to approach or approximate the mean of the population. And the standard deviation for the sampling distribution, I don't seem to be able to highlight that, the, sampling, the, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is going to approach the true population standard deviation divided by the square root of the size of the sample. All right, so visually, that sort of implies what we see here on slide 7. Regardless of the true distribution of the underlying observations, uh, x here might be people's ages, people's weights, people's heights, uh, households' incomes, uh, maximum daily temperature at some specific location, uh, and we might have a, uh, an ordinary uniform distribution. We might have this funny-looking uh, distribution where the most probable things are at the, begin at the minimum and maximum. Uh, here we have a declining distribution. Here at the bottom, we have an actual normal distribution. The point is, regardless of what the distribution looks like for the underlying population, as our sample size increases, going from n equal 2 up to n equal 30 or n equal 100 or n equal 1,000 or whatever, the distribution of the sample means will get more and more and more uh, normal shaped. And the mean of the samples will converge to the true mean of the underlying population and the standard deviation of the samples will converge to the true population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Okay, so let's illustrate this idea with an actual data set uh, which is unusual because we do have the entire population data set. This is for water consumption in a place called Cobb County. And the so-called water authority here is the organization that, uh, you know, that pumps out clean water to all of the various households in Cobb County and sends a bill to each of the households in Cobb County uh, for those people to pay for the amount of water that they use. Okay, now the purpose of the study here was to target whether we could figure out some way of reducing the water consumption. Okay, and we're not going to talk about whether we can successfully reduce water consumption yet. That will come uh, later on. But we are going to use this data set to illustrate how the central limit theorem works. Okay, now because we're sending bills to every uh, user of water in the entire county, we do have essentially the entire population and we can directly measure the population mean and the population standard deviation of water usage. 
Here is a histogram of what that water usage looks like. And let me pull up the particular study here. It's in here, I know. Oh, here we go. Okay. Central Limit Theorem Water Conservation. So here is the... Uh, we're just going to look at water consumption during the year 20, 2006. Okay. Now, um, we have the underlying data here. For the entire population, the histogram of water usage looks like uh, what's shown here on the left. Uh, we have a small number of houses that use very little, uh, a, a small number of users that use very little water. The mode for the distribution is around uh, 5,000 uh, uh, users of water and those users of water in that value around, you know, that mode around 5,000, uh, as a rough guess, appear to be using somewhere between, oh, let's say 20 and 40 uh, thousand gallons. Okay, this, uh, this diagram is in terms of thousands of gallons for, for the year. All right, so that's the most common amount of water to be using. Uh, the median probably falls in here somewhere around, let's say, 50,000 or so. And we're shown here that the mean amount of water is 58,000 gallons per year. Standard deviation is 41,000 uh, gallons per year. And we see here that there are a few uses of water who use an enormous amount of water. Uh, like up to up to 10 times the median amount of water usage. You know, maybe these are uh, places like golf courses that are watering huge amounts of lawn or industries that use a huge amount of water for manufacturing or, or really rich people with uh, Olympic-sized swimming pools or, or whatever it might be. Uh, just as an aside, notice that the shape of this distribution of water usage is pretty similar to the distribution of uh, income within a nation that we looked at uh, before. Uh, this shape of distribution for uses of stuff or income of people or whatever, uh, these distributions tend to look uh, uh, this way. All right, so... That is our uh, our uh, uh, our true population uh, distribution, and therefore we can compute a true population mean and a true population uh, standard deviation. Let's see whether the central limit theorem holds true for this particular unusual distribution where we do actually have the the population. Uh, parameters. All right, so I have pulled up the uh, water conservation uh, data for the year 2006. So it's this same data that we just looked at here. And let me leave that data on the screen. Okay, so um, what we're going to do now is to create a histogram of X bars, that is a histogram of sample means with a sample size of 10. So we're going to select 10 water users at random from this uh, population, and we're going to compute the sample mean, the X bar, for that sample, as well as the, uh, the S, the standard deviation for that sample. And we're going to create a histogram of these samples. We're going to do sample after sample after sample after sample, and we're going to create a histogram of these different X bars. 
we're told here to please draw at least two samples. Uh, a histogram of just one sample of 10 is not very interesting. It's just a point, right? So my sample size is 10. I'm going to leave the sample size fixed, and I'm going to draw one sample. Okay, since there's only one sample, uh, there's nothing to show in terms of our histogram yet. For this particular sample, the average water use was 61,500 uh, gallons per year. Now, if I draw another sample, you know, a different or another random collection of 10 uh, water users, uh, I get a different collection of water users, uh, and that sample has its own uh, sample mean, 71.80. And now we have enough samples to be able to create a uh, histogram. And we're told that the mean, okay, the mean of these two X bars is uh, halfway between. It's not too hard to see that it's going to be, I mean, we, we've conveniently got 61 and a half, 71 and a little more than a half. So it's going to be 66 and a little more than a half. It turns out to be 66.65, and that's shown by the red line. Now, as I continue drawing different random samples of size 10, my histogram keeps being updated. Now my histogram has three samples in it. Now four. Now five. Now six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Interesting. Notice that I've drawn 10 samples uh, of 10 observations each. And even though I've only drawn 10 samples, my distribution of these 10 samples is starting to look kind of mound-shaped. Uh, and if I just jump to the finish line here, let me draw 1,000 samples of 10. This is going to take several seconds, so I'm going to cut out the delay. Okay, there we are. So now we've drawn a thousand, well, a thousand plus, however, we drew, we drew 10 before, and now we've drawn a thousand more samples. So this histogram is of uh, 10,000, I'm, I'm sorry, this histogram is of 1,010 random samples of size 10 from this water usage distribution. And you'll notice that this histogram is approaching a, a normal distribution shape. And the mean of all of these sample means is 58.15, which is very close to the true population mean, 58.3. Likewise, I think I can, there we go, scroll down a little bit. Likewise, we get told that the standard deviation uh, of the sample means is 12.963. How does that relate to the population standard deviation of 41.4? All right, well, the central limit theorem tells us that as we draw more and more and more and more samples of a given size, that the mean of those sample means will approach the true mean of the, of the underlying distribution. So our mean is getting closer and closer to 58.3. The standard deviation of the sample means is going to be the original distribution standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So uh, it's going to be 41.4 divided by the square root of 10. <clears throat> All right, the square root of 10 is, of course, a, a touch bigger than 3, but let's just use 3 for gags. Uh, if I take 41.4 and divide by 3, I get, uh, what do I get? I get 12.4 uh, uh, approximately, and the mean of these samples is 12.96. So, we're, we're definitely in the right uh, neighborhood. Uh, our 
our mean of, uh, sorry, our standard deviation of the 1,010 sample means is approximately, actually just a little bit more than one-third of the population standard deviation, which is what we would expect. Now for gags, let me draw another 1,000 samples. We'll see if we get even closer to looking like a normal distribution. In fact, I'm going to do this a few more times, and I will clip out all the weighting. Okay, so I have now drawn another 3,000 samples of size 10, uh, which took several minutes. Uh, you might uh, run out of memory if you try this yourself, so be careful. Um, we now have a total of 4,010 samples of size 10. The mean value is 58.37, which is even closer to the population mean that we calculated. The standard deviation is 13.115. And let's do a little more exact calculation of the population standard deviation divided by the square root of 10 to see how that looks. Let me pull up my uh, giant one cell spreadsheet. Okay, so we're going to have uh, 41.4, which is the population standard deviation, divided by uh, 10 to the 0 0.5 power. And 13.09, which is really, really close to 13.112, all right? So <laughs> I'll grant you that this is, this is one distribution. This is one demonstration. Uh, and yet we do see that even though our original uh, population distribution doesn't look even close to normal, uh, as we take samples of size 10, and we compute the distribution of the means of those samples, uh, and we then compute the standard deviation of the means of those samples, uh, the central limit theorem is, is borne out. We do get a mean of the sampling distribution that is the same as the mean of the population, and we do get a standard deviation for our sampling distribution that is equal or, you know, really close to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Now, if I were to increase my sample size from 10 to a larger number like 100 and uh, use that uh, as my sample size and then draw a whole bunch of samples of size 100 and so on, uh, my standard deviation of my sample means would converge even more quickly to the standard deviation of the population, in this case, divided by 10, all right? The square root of 100, the square root of the sample size would be 10. And so if I change my sample size to 100, my standard deviation here should, uh, should become 4. Uh, well, 4.14. All right, so that is a demo of the central limit theorem in a rare circumstance where we know the population uh, mean and the population standard deviation. Usually we don't know the population parameters, and consequently we're using the sample mean and the sample uh, <laughs> we're using the mean of the sample means and the standard de deviation of the sample means to give us values that we can use to estimate the population mean and the population standard deviation. Okay, so let's summarize and review some of the key points here. A sample estimate that is one of the X bar sub I's. Uh, <laughs> sample estimates <laughs> of the population uh, parameter mu 
these things vary from sample to sample. When we take a sample and compute the mean of the sample, we're not, of course, always going to get the same uh, values. And consequently, there is a distribution of these uh, sample means. The sample mean is itself a random variable. The central limit theorem says that for a fixed sample size n, assuming n is large enough, the sampling distribution of the means approaches a normal distribution. And the sample distribution, the, the mean of the sampling distribution of the means will be the same or will approach the population mean. Now, no specific estimate taken from a specific sample is going to be exactly the true population mean. Because of the central limit theorem, assuming our sample size is large enough, we know that a lot of these estimates are going to be pretty close to the true mean, but others are not going to be particularly close uh, to the true mean. All right. Now, in the real world, where we don't know the population mean in advance, we don't know for sure which estimates are close and which ones are far away. Uh, we do know because of the central limit theorem that if we were to take a very large number of samples of size n, the, the mean of those sample means would approach the population mean. Okay, now, the reason, the whole reason for sampling in the first place uh, is because we don't know the, the true population mean. And we need to get, uh, we're trying to get an estimate of uh, the population mean. All right, and so here's the example that we just did with uh, sales of water to various customers uh, in this particular county during the year 2006. And we know that the sampling distribution of the uh, sample means uh, gave us uh, an X bar, an, an, an average of the X bar sub i, that was a good estimate of the true population mean, and that the standard deviation of that sampling distribution is an approximation for the true standard deviation over the square root of the sample size. Okay, so why is the central limit theorem, or the so-called CLT, important to us? Well, the sampling distribution of the X bar sub i is normally distributed no matter how the underlying individual X values are distributed, assuming that the sample size is large enough. Okay, so... So n is left out of this sentence. But assuming that n is large enough, then the sampling distribution of the x uh, of x bar is approaches normally distributed. Now, because the sampling distribution approaches being normally distributed, we can actually make probabil probabilistic statements about the relationship between the x bar, that is the the mean of the sample means, and the underlying true population mean, even if we don't know the true population mean, and even if we don't know exactly how the individual x observations are uh, distributed. All right, so that seems perhaps like a bit of a magic trick. Okay, now how large should the sample size be? Well, this is uh, not clear cut. It depends on what the underlying probability distribution of the x sub i actually looks like. If the underlying x sub i are already normally, dist normally distributed, 
then the simple central limit theorem automatically holds regardless of the sample size. Okay, if you know that the underlying distribution is normal, uh, then uh, you can make some probability statements about the normal distribution uh, even if your sample size is very small. Let me scoot up to the uh, diagrams that we looked at here. So this bottom one, this is a normal distribution for the original population. The individual x sub i are normally distributed here. Consequently, the central limit theorem applies uh, even for n just equal to 2. Uh, and obviously the the standard uh, deviation of the sample means uh, around the underlying population mean uh, gets tighter and tighter as the sample size increases. If the underlying x sub i are not normal, but are not terribly skewed, <laughs> okay, what does not terribly skewed mean? <laughs> well, this is kind of in the in the eye of the beholder. Um, you know, you can you can look at a plot of the distribution and make a decision for yourself uh, about how skewed or unskewed uh, the distribution is. Um, in any case, the central limit theorem is likely to hold for sample sizes of thirty or more. Now this is sort of uh, this is sort of empirical, and if we go back again to our diagrams, okay, uh, we have some uh, distributions here that are way far from uh, normal, and by the time we get to thirty, sample size equal thirty, the at least visually the the uh, distribution of the x-bars uh, is approximately normal. We could probably come up with some really bizarre underlying distributions that didn't look good for uh, n out, uh, you know, until we got out past n equal 30. But based on this kind of empirical study, uh, you will often hear that if you have a sample size of 30 or more, you can rely on the CLT. Uh, I'll tell you frankly that I am always uh, suspicious of that, and I, uh, I, I, prefer to, I prefer to overshoot myself. All right. So we know that... Sorry, that didn't work too well. Uh, we know that the... Standard division. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to circle it here or with my mouse. We know that the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the x bar uh, sub i is related to the underlying population standard deviation uh, by the sampling distribution of the x, the, the uh, standard deviation of the sampling distribution uh, approaches the population standard deviation over the square root of the sample size, okay? Now, the term for describing this uh, value is the standard error of the mean. Why is it called the standard error of the mean rather than the standard deviation of the sample means? Well, we would have to go back into history and discover who invented this phrase. But in statistics, it's understood that the standard error of the mean, often abbreviated as just plain the standard error, is the standard deviation uh, of the uh, sampling distribution of the means. Okay, so this is just a piece of arbitrary terminology that you're just going to have to get used to. When you get more data, you get better estimates. Now, uh, the 
the standard deviation of the sample means gets tighter and therefore the mean of the sampling distribution is going to be closer to on average uh, the true population mean if you were to take you know infinitely many uh, samples then this uh, distribution of the uh, sample means would get uh, tighter and tighter and tighter in terms of its uh, standard deviation uh, until you 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 basically until this thing basically comes down to a vertical line right at the uh, the population mean. The problem here, of course, is that gathering samples and computing means of samples is costly, and so there's usually a trade-off between. Uh, how long it takes you to obtain samples, how much it costs you to obtain samples, how long it takes you to compute these uh, sample means and standard deviations of sample means uh, in order to get a good enough estimate that you can make a good decision about your data. Uh, all right, so this we've seen before. Um, this is our uh, 2006 annual water sales to people in this particular county, and it's and it's not normally distributed. But if we have a, a larger sample size here, we're selecting a sample size of 144. We originally did it with a sample size of 10, but for a sample size of 144 the distribution of the sample means becomes even tighter and the standard error of the distribution which i can't seem to highlight the standard error of the distribution becomes uh 3.45 okay that is the population standard deviation of 41.4 uh divided by the square root of 144 which is 12. okay so that gets us to 3.45 and you know the bigger that we make n if we made n uh, 10,000, so that the square root was 100, then our standard deviation, our standard error, excuse me, would be all the way down to 0 0.414. Okay, here's just another example of using the uh, normal distribution tool. All right, so here we're plugging in uh, the standard deviation, pardon me, the standard error of the, uh, the standard error of the mean of the sampling distribution as our standard deviation value and the mean as our mean value. And we're computing, we can compute a probability of the, the mean of the sampling distribution falling between 52.6 and 64 okay uh, the probability that that's the case is uh, 0 0.9 based on the normal distribution and if we crank things up to 400 instead of 144 that tightens our standard error over the mean even further down to a standard deviation of 2.07 now the probability that our sampling distribution mean falls between 52.6 and 64 okay that's the same range that we had back here the probability that we fall between 52.6 and 64 uh, increases to 0.994 from 0 0.90 all right so boosting our sample size from 144 to 400 uh, very significantly increased the probability uh, that our uh, sampling distribution mean uh, falls between those two bounds all right so let us test our understanding here uh, the taxi and takeoff times of commercial jets is a random variable with a mean of 8.5 minutes and a standard deviation of 2.5 minutes. 
All right, so let's make a note of this. The uh, the uh, mean is 8.5 minutes, and the standard deviation is 2.5 minutes. What is the probability that for 36 jets... Total taxi and takeoff time will be less than 320 minutes. So what is the probability that for 36 jets, total takeoff, total taxi and takeoff time, all right, probability that for 36 jets, the sum of the times is less than 320 minutes. Okay, so that's our first crack at kind of writing this down. Now, uh, so each jet has a mean of eight and a half minutes for taxi and takeoff and a standard deviation of 2.5 minutes. Notice that we are not given any shape for this distribution. We don't know whether this is a normal distribution uh, or some other shape of uh, distribution. Uh, maybe some, maybe a lot of jets take off very quickly and a few jets take off very slowly. So the distribution is quite heavily skewed to the, to the right, perhaps. Uh, we are being asked, what is the probability that 36 jets will take off in uh, taxi and take off in less than 320 minutes? Well, so what we're being basically told here is that our number of samples is 36 jets. And notice that the sum of the times being less than 320 minutes is equivalent to the average time being 320 minutes per jet. All right, so asking us what is the probability that the total time is less than 320 minutes is equivalent to asking us for this sample of 36 jets, what is the probability that the average is less than 320 over 36 minutes? Okay, so let's rewrite this uh, on a fresh page. I forgot my less than in here. So we have, and, and by the way, uh, you know, this airport has been operating for a long, 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 long time. And so we're going to assume that the mean uh, taxi and takeoff time, that this is a population value, and it is 8.5 minutes, and that the standard deviation is a population value, and it is 2.5 minutes. We have a sample size of n equal to 36. Uh, because n is greater than 30, even though we don't know, uh, we haven't been told the actual underlying distribution. Because n is greater than 30, we're going to assume that the uh, central limit theorem applies. And we are being asked, what is the probability that x bar, the mean of the sampling distribution, is less than 320 over 36? which I should have computed. <laughs> Let me do that, and I'll come back. Okay, so that fraction turns out to be uh, 8.889, uh, let's say. It's basically just repeating eights. Okay, because the central limit theorem applies, we know that uh, x bar is going to converge to uh, 8.5, and we know that the 
sample, the standard error of the mean is going to converge to sigma over square root of n. Oh, look at that. Isn't that clever? So that's going to be 2.5 over 6, which is, I think I can even do this in my head, 0 0.4. One six more or less, uh, zero point four one six seven, I think. All right, and now we can use our uh, normal probability tool to discover with eight point five as our uh, mean and zero point four one six seven as our standard error of the mean. We can find out what the probability is that the mean is less than 8.889. Let's switch to the tool and give that a try. All right, so, oh, here's my normal distribution. I want the probability of x being less than x naught. Let me scoot my normal distribution tool over to the right so that we can see our values. Okay, so x bar, the mean, is going to be 8.5. 8.5. The standard deviation, the standard error of the mean, is going to be 0 0.4167. 4167, assuming I did that right. And the probability of getting a value less than 8.889 is going to be 0.8247. Right? So. That means that the probability that x bar for these 36 flights is less than 8.889 is going to be 0 0.8247. Alrighty, hope that made sense. Take care.